Hello and welcome to another episode of Twimmel Talk, the podcast where I interview interesting people doing interesting things in machine learning and artificial intelligence. I'm your host, Sam Charrington. If you listened to last week's show, you know that today, Friday, May 3rd, is the last day to register for our O'Reilly Strata Hadoop World Conference giveaway. You've got until midnight Pacific time to register, and you can do that via our new Facebook page. Whether or not you're interested in attending Strata Hadoop, we'd really appreciate you taking a moment to like our Facebook page, as well as subscribe to our new YouTube channel. We'll link to both of these in the show notes. Last week, I mentioned that I'm working on an event called the Future of Data Summit, and I'm excited to share some of the details of that event with you now. The event is part of a larger IT industry conference called Interop ITX, and I've worked with the team at UBM that organizes the event for several years now. At last year's conference, I presented a workshop called the IT Leader's Guide to Machine Learning. And based on the strong response to that session, they asked me to work with them to do something bigger this time around. The result is a two-day Future of Data Summit that will bring together noted experts and practitioners to discuss the future of enterprise data from a variety of technology perspectives. We'll be exploring the innovation and opportunity being offered in areas such as, of course, machine learning and AI and cognitive services, but also IoT and edge computing, augmented and virtual reality, blockchain, algorithmic IT operations, data security and privacy, and more. I've handpicked the speakers to both inspire summit attendees with a view into what's possible, as well as to provide practical insights into how to get there. To give you a taste of what I've got planned, here are just three of the 16 great speakers on our agenda for the summit. Well, first off, you remember Josh Bloom, a former guest on the podcast, whose startup Wise.io was recently acquired by GE. Well, Josh will be joining us to speak about building AI products from idea to production. Intel's Asaf Araki will give us a view into the next five plus years of compute storage and network innovation in his talk titled, How the Future of Hardware Enables the Future of Data. And Diana Kelly, Global Executive Security Advisor at IBM, will be discussing the future threat landscape and how to protect cloud, IoT, and big data systems. I've got more information about the event, as well as a preliminary agenda, posted at twimlai.com slash futureofdata. On that page, you'll also find details for registering for the conference and a code offering a special discount for Twimmel listeners. To give you a bit of a sample of the type of content you'll get at the event, our guest on the show today is James McCaffrey, who's a research engineer at Microsoft Research. James will be speaking at the summit on understanding deep neural networks, and that's the focus of our conversation on the podcast as well. We had a good time with this conversation, and even if you know your way around a DNN, I think you'll pick up some interesting tidbits. Enjoy the show and check out the event page at twimlai.com slash future of data or the show notes page at twimlai.com slash talk slash 13 for more information on James or the summit. And now on to the show. Hey, everyone. I am here with James McCaffrey. James is with Microsoft Research, and we've got an exciting show for you uh, this time. To, and we're going to be spending some time digging into deep neural nets. Uh, James, why don't you introduce yourself? Uh, hi, Sam. Thanks. Uh, thanks for having me today. Um, my name is James McCaffrey. I work at Microsoft Research. Uh, before working at research in the research uh, division of Microsoft, I worked in the product groups. Uh, so I have some experience sort of on the pragmatic side of things. And before joining Microsoft, I was a university professor uh, in mathematics and computer science. So um, uh, I, I made that transition from academia to industry. At Microsoft, my area of expertise is uh, machine learning and in particular um, neural networks. I'm uh, one of uh, one of the things I uh, do here at Microsoft Research, or my role, is somewhat of a hybrid. Uh, at Microsoft Research, we have uh, I'm going to guess maybe in the neighborhood of um, 300 
uh, serious researchers, world-class guys that are, uh, have very uh, specific domain knowledge. And uh, my, my uh, role is uh, because I have enough uh, mathematical knowledge to understand these guys, uh, and also um, my software engineering uh, background. I act as a uh, interface between the engineering groups here at Microsoft and the research groups, and I do, of course, some research on my own. Mm, interesting, interesting. So the way we got connected was, in fact, uh, you're going to be speaking at an event that I'm organizing uh, as part of the Interop ITX conference. Uh, in May, and that event is called the Future of Data, and uh, you're going to be speaking there about understanding deep neural nets. Uh, that's a topic that you've been spending quite a bit of time on of late, isn't it? Well, yeah, yeah sort of interesting. Yes and no. Um, I'd say I've been uh, looking at neural networks for many, many, many years. But we're sort of in this area of uh, the third wave of artificial intelligence and in particular deep neural networks. And uh, there's no clear consensus on exactly why uh, deep neural networks, which is a sort of a, I'd call it a subset of artificial intelligence or a tool uh, that enables artificial intelligence, why they're making this giant comeback again. Um, maybe some of your listeners can remember back in the 80s, the uh, first wave of neural networks that uh, uh, held great promise, at least theoretically, but they tended to overpromise and underdeliver. And then for a long time, artificial intelligence, the phrase, wasn't really used because it had sort of gotten a stigma attached to it. But then, um, here, here's the analogy I always use for people. I, I think many of your listeners might remember some of the uh, speech recognition software that was popular in the 90s. Uh, uh, Dragon uh, was very well known. In fact, they still really are well known too. Uh -huh. But then all of a sudden, about two, two years ago, two and a half years ago, uh, out, seemingly out of nowhere, uh, we had Siri and Cortana and Alexa um, from uh, Apple, uh, Microsoft, and uh, Amazon, of course. Uh, and the speech recognition just seemed to take this gigantic quantum jump in improvement. And I'm, I'm fortunate enough to be working directly with those guys that created that quantum jump. In fact, it really was. And it was all due to deep neural networks. And now uh, you mentioned speech recognition. That's that's clearly one of the big application areas. Um, there was some news recently, I think within the past three months or so, about a group that um, I guess just hit a new, uh, kind of passed a new bar in terms of speech recognition accuracy. I think it was 95 or um, high 90s percent. Uh, was that at Microsoft? Uh, yeah. It's interesting because there's uh, uh, several different benchmarks, and right now there's tremendous amounts of excitement. Uh, I'm sort of beating around the bushes, and my, my my bottom line answer in a second will be I'm not sure it could well have been, um, but th there's um, literally breakthroughs. I was sitting in a talk just a few weeks ago where there was sort of like an arms race on some of these uh, benchmark problems and therefore um, uh, speech recognition, uh, text recognition, uh, basically any kind of you know input type things. And literally uh, one research group after another is improving and uh, jumping over the others on a uh, week by week basis. I mean, uh, it reminds me of the, uh, the early days of jet aircraft in the 1950s when there seemed to be a new speed record set every few months or few weeks or months. Well, we're sort of in that same area of frantic activity. Um, well, that, that doesn't sound quite – it's not so much frantic activity, but uh, significant advances are happening uh, weekly now in, in uh, several areas of – uh, AI, and most of them are directly related to deep neural networks. So maybe let's take a step back. I'm curious, how do you define and describe deep neural nets to people? 
it, 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 this is very interesting. Um, I have a way. I I I get asked this question so much. So, <clears throat> excuse me. Even among uh, my colleagues who have PhDs in all different kinds of fields, and my uh, peer uh, engineers who are some of the best engineers in the world, um, it's very very difficult that to explain what deep neural networks are without a picture of some sort. I I found that the only way I can uh, uh, describe completely uh, to the satisfaction of anyone is to use a diagram. Um, and uh, that's what I uh, do in many of my talks, including the one I'll be doing for you. So using vocabulary, it's, it's not. But the main difference is this, or I'll try to uh, uh, express as best I can. Whenever I try to explain what a deep neural network is, I start and say, and it, it kind of makes sense, you have to have an absolute solid understanding of what a so-called regular neural network is. And because the distinction, until, until recently, when you said neural network, you meant what is now called a single hidden layer neural network. They're the simplest forms of neural network. And deep neural networks can actually have several different meanings. At the basic level, a deep neural network is simply, I mean, it, it's really simple. It's just a more complicated basic neural network uh, so if with I can, multiple hidden layers. Mm -hmm. If I can interrupt you and go back to the single hidden uh, layer neural network, we're talking about a neural network that uh, will have an, an input layer mm -hmm. and then this hidden layer and an output layer and basically – each of those layers has a set of weights assigned to them and using some math and algorithms, backpropagation, for example, mm -hmm. uh, you're able to, based on throwing a bunch of training data at these neural networks, come up with a quote unquote optimal set of weights, uh, which really is what defines the neural network. Is that like is that uh, a good way to describe what this single... That's, that's absolutely correct. Um, put another way, um, in the end, a neural network is just a very complex mathematical equation that can be used to make predictions. Mm. The number of inputs is determined by your data. Suppose you're trying to predict um, the political party affiliation of a person, and that could be Democratic Republican or other. Mm -hmm. um, so that's the what you're trying to predict. And your uh, uh, features, which means the uh, variables you use to make the prediction, uh, suppose that could be uh, four things. The person's age, their annual income, their level of education, and some other uh, metrics, so forth. Therefore, your neural network would have four input nodes, and it would have three output nodes. But the, the hidden layer processing nodes, uh, this hidden layer is where the processing, most of the processing is done. The number of those nodes has to be determined by trial and error. But in a regular neural network, there is one such layer. So it might be maybe 10 hidden nodes. But with a deep neural network, you just add multiple layers. You might have three hidden layers of 10 processing nodes, uh, 20 processing nodes, and then 10 processing nodes. And in fact, neural networks have been getting much, much deeper than three layers of late. Is that right? Uh, quite right. The, um, until relatively recently, that there's been a comp two, two things have been occurring that have led to these dramatic increases uh, across multiple areas of artificial intelligence. One, one of them is that we're just getting more raw horsepower to process these things. Um, it turns out that they get exponentially more complex, and so it, it turns out that we're, you know, we're just getting more and more uh, processing power. But the second mm -hmm. thing is, uh, combined at the same time, is that we're getting very uh, clever with architecture, and that is combining these different hidden layers in very clever ways uh, instead of doing it naively. This, the analogy in this case reminds me of the advances in computer chess programs, where computer chess programs all of a sudden got very, very good, better than any human being, uh, uh, somewhat unexpectedly, and it was, it, it was not due merely to more uh, processing power, and it wasn't due uh, simply to uh, better algorithms. It was a combination of the two. 
Uh, so we're getting quickly to an area that uh, I find really interesting, uh, and that is the architecture of deep neural nets. Um, I, I have a, I have a ton of of questions about this, so um, I'm, I'm excited that we get a chance to <laughs> chat about it. Uh, I know. <laughs> I, I guess as a as a as a preface to this, um, I know that Microsoft research has been you know, one of many research organizations that's been kind of pushing the the frontier here. Uh, and in fact, in 2015, they authored a paper on what's called deep residual learning uh, that won the, the, the ImageNet competition that year. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, uh, you know, I guess I, what I want to talk about is like, what is uh, deep neural net architecture and, you know, what is deep residual learning and what are convolutional layers like, you know, so take us from this description of a deep neural net and layers through the, how those, the architecture of those networks has evolved and, you know, what are, what are, how do we think about all that right now? Okay, I'll, I'll do my best to, to describe these. Again, when I do describe these, um, I almost always have to use a diagram because when we're talking about architecture, it's sort of going to be a bunch of nodes and how they're connected. So let me sort of uh, uh, talk about all of these things that you've mentioned are, are closely related. They're, they're somewhat cousins to each other. Um, let's, let's take the... Um, uh, the the re- residual neural network that you just described. Now, this is more of a, a, an exotic uh, variety. And in my mind, at least, uh, the, re- the residual neural network is very, very close to, a close cousin to uh, a type of neural network called a recurrent neural network. Uh, they're usually abbreviated mm-hmm. RNNs. Right. Now, what, what makes a recurrent neural network special. And by the way, there's a a ton of research activity on all of these things that we're talking about now. Mm -hmm. But a a standard neural network does not maintain state. You feed it some inputs and it produces some outputs. Then the next set of inputs come along. The, The neural network is essentially wiped clean. It doesn't maintain state from that previous set of inputs and outputs. A recurrent neural network has memory, an internal memory, so to speak, and that manifests itself with just some extra nodes. Um, If you can imagine uh, a a regular neural network with a hidden layer of nodes, say 10 nodes in there, Mm -hmm. there's going to be a recurrent neural network has a second group of 10 nodes that maintain the memory of the previous input. This allows this, just intuitively you can tell, that this makes the neural network much more powerful and smart because it has, uh, in an English word, it it has context. And this means, for instance, suppose you're trying to predict, uh, you're coming along and um, your inputs are words in a sentence, and you're trying to predict what the next word might be. Uh, this is something that you might see on like a uh, uh, a smartphone when you know you're typing a message and it tries to predict what your next word might be, although there's some pretty pretty rudimentary right now. Now, if you just used a regular neural network to do that, um, each you know input is separate and you wouldn't um, have any context. But a recurrent neural network would have a a shadow of the memory of the previous inputs. And it would be able to make a better guess at what the next word is because <clears throat> the next word in a sentence is clearly going to depend on what the first words were. Mm-hmm. So these uh, recurrent neural networks, um, so sometimes they're categorized into short, recur- short-term short recurrent neural networks mm-hmm. where they only have a limited ability to remember quite recent inputs or they can be – the one of the most exciting areas of research right now is these long-term recurrent neural networks, and they just maintain more memory. And these things have the potential to be super powerful. And to get to sort of close the circle here, um, in my mind, I view uh, the Microsoft residual 
uh, neural networks as one of these long-term recurrent neural networks with some special architecture features thrown in, sort of custom. So you mentioned long, uh, long-term memory and short-term memory. Uh, and in fact, on this show, I've talked quite a bit about applications using uh, LSTM RNN, so which right. are long short-term memory. <laughs> How <Yeah>. does that <laughs> relate to long-term and short-term? They, um, uh, the uh, well, to tell you the truth, the vocabulary is not very standardized. Okay, and um, they they all uh, from a. Um, so maybe these long short-term memories are what you're referring to as long-term and – Yes, that's – okay, thank you. Okay. <laughs> you precisely <laughs> said what I was trying to say. <laughs> got it, got it. Okay, so yeah, I, I have been – we have been hearing tons about different applications of these LSTM networks, uh, you know, often relating to the example that you use, which is your um, predicting uh, – trying to predict words or, or things like that from a sentence, mm -hmm. um, which kind of brings us to uh, maybe the difference between predictive networks and generative networks. Oh, okay. Uh, very good. This is, if I had to pick one area where there's more excitement, intellectual excitement in the research community than any other, it's exactly what we said, these generative neural networks. Um, they're called GAN. One of the most popular forms of these is called GAN, a generative adversarial network, where it, it's really conceptually a little bit difficult to grasp. And here's how I think about it. Um, a generative neural network does just what you might expect from its description is it doesn't try to make a prediction based on input. It more or less tries to create new inputs in some sense, which is uh, a little bit hard to, to grasp. Now, I got, I, I'll be the first to say that I don't fully understand these things. Like everybody else, um, they've only been around, uh, really, the, the, the biggest name is a, a guy named Ian Goodfellow. Mm -hmm. who is the best known name in this area. And these things have only really been around for a matter of months now. Uh, by that, I mean maybe a year and a half to two two years or so. Uh -huh. So a lot of us are still trying to figure it out. The, the classic example, at least, that I used on my uh, blog post is that you can train a neural – you can feed a neural network a bunch of Van Gogh paintings. And then that uh, generative neural network – will be able to generate and create paintings based on the style of Van Gogh. And in short, what it's doing is it's sort of separating out. It's, it's learning to separate style from content. Well, this is all, you know, very difficult for me to get my uh, head around. And I'll say that people who are much, much smarter than me uh, figure that this is something that could lead to tremendous breakthroughs in the future. Mm -hmm. uh, and for folks that want to dig into that, uh, that last uh, use case, I believe the paper is called Neural Artistic Style Transfer, uh, or at the very least, if you Google that or Bing that, uh, you'll be able to find uh, lots of information about, about that application. Right. You're exactly right. Uh, but the, yeah, so... So there's generative networks and GANs. In fact, I just had an opportunity to hear Ian Goodfellow talk about this last week. Uh, I was at a, an event, uh, a deep learning summit, a uh, reworked deep learning summit in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. um, and the basic idea there, as I understand it, is you've got, um, as you mentioned, a network that is kind of trained to uh, produce or approximate inputs. Uh, and then you feed those, feed the stuff that it spits out to another network that is, mm -hmm. uh, I think called a discriminator network that's trained to basically measure how close those inputs are to, uh, the real life thing, mm -hmm. the thing that you're trying to approximate. And then you basically have a feedback loop between these two. That, that's correct. They're, they're called adversarial because really under the covers, there's two 
neural networks going on, where one is trying to generate um, information uh, and fake out the other neural networks. So they're adversarial, they're working against each other. And uh, that that this relates more to the uh, architecture, the engineering architecture. But as you said, the, the real goal is to generate information. And the idea being there that if you if a neural network is smart enough to generate uh, information, then it's also smart enough to uh, understand and discriminate information. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we talked about uh, RNNs. What about convolutional neural nets? What? How are those different from uh, RNNs and other types of deep neural nets? Uh, it's funny that um, we're, we're talking about convolutional networks. You know, they're usually abbreviated CNNs. That. Now they seem like they're um, just sort of old news, but in fact, they're quite new still. Uh, the, the main problem with deep neural networks, as I described, a basic deep neural network, which is a, a simple architecture, but with just lots of nodes in multiple layers. The problem there is the training. Um, the number of weights and biases that you have to compute or, you know, using your optimization algorithm just becomes intractable. Um, in a simple neural network, suppose you have um, uh, five inputs, uh, six, okay, five inputs, six hidden, and three outputs. The number of weights you have to do is five times six plus six times three plus six, plus three. Um, well, as you expand the number of nodes, uh, these are, I, I, in English, you'd say it increases exponentially. That's not mathematically correct. <laughs> Let's just say it gets really big, really fast. It gets intractable. Does it drive so, you crazy when people do say that and it's not yeah. actually exponential? <laughs> uh, it depends on how much I've been drinking. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> um, uh, you know, I, I try to um, see because when I um, here here at Microsoft, I, I speak to different audiences. I'll speak to business leaders. I'll speak to engineers and I'll speak to mathematicians. And when you're speaking to anybody but the mathematicians, if you try to phrase yourself too carefully and be correct, you you mess up your argument. But when <laughs> I uh, when I say, for instance, that the output of a neural network a classifier are probabilities, oh, my math colleagues will go nuts and go, no, they're not, no, they're not. I go, okay, yeah, I know they're not. But <laughs> but anyway, back to uh, convolutional uh, neural networks, because a uh, straightforward approach just isn't tractable computationally. The idea, and uh, let's see, this was, uh, uh, oh, okay. I always have trouble remembering, uh, Yan Li Kun was, is the big name here. He created an architecture where the really, the, uh, the main idea of this architecture was to make these things tractable. Uh, CNNs are used almost exclusively for image processing. Um, imagine a, uh, uh, I, this is an area that I'm not too familiar with. I mean, I, I'm familiar with the math of it all, but imagine you have an image or a set of images and you want to classify them. Uh, the classic example is called the MNIST database where there's a, a data set of umpteen thousand handwritten digit characters that were culled from um, IRS tax returns um, and, and digitized. Um, and so suppose you want to classify, you know, what, what is this? Is it a digit one? Is it a digit two or so forth? Well, even a very small image is going to have thousands of pixels and each pixel is going to be one input. Now, if you get go up to like a seriously large picture or even something that a, uh, a smartphone can take, you've got millions of inputs and millions of inputs, uh, you, you just can't deal with that in a, a, a basic way. So the, the the brilliancy of convolutional neural networks is to simplify. It still uses the same basic ideas of neural networks, but it uses them in very clever ways by slicing and dicing the image up 
and sharing weights. Instead of having to calculate a million times a million, which is whatever that is, weights, you can break it up and there's a part of the uh, secret sauce is shared weights, where weights in a particular area of inputs, meaning a particular area of the image, are shared. And there's a lot more to it than that. Convolutional networks were really a, uh, a remarkable achievement of architectural design, and they're now considered more or less standard. Many of the tools um, that you can find, in particular uh, Google's tool, whose name I can never remember because I, I, uh, I don't use it. It runs strictly on Linux. Do, do you know which one I'm talking about, Sam? Uh, Google's TensorFlow. TensorFlow. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Yes. Sure. Anyway, um, so Google's TensorFlow can do CNNs, and Microsoft has a recently released uh, basically uh, same idea called CNTK. <laughs> not one of <laughs> not a, not a real – it doesn't – slide off the tongue really easily there. But these things are, are now well known. But I always like to point out that it took a lot of researchers a lot of years. In fact, the CNN version that's in common use now is called, you know, CNN version five or something like that, which means there were, you know, many major iterations and tons of work that went on. So in short, to summarize, you know, these CNNs to the best of my knowledge, are used almost exclusively for image processing, but they are the state of the art. Um, however, they have some really interesting problems that uh, a lot of there's a lot of thought about some of the limitations of CNNs. Can you speak a bit to those? Yeah, sure. There was um, uh, a very uh, interest, a fascinating paper that came out of Google research. Um, what was it called? It was called the um, Intriguing Properties of Neural Networks, something like this. Hmm. Um, and the key takeaway is, and I like to use this example, um, which I don't think was in the paper, but other people followed up on it. You can uh, suppose you uh, train a CNN um, to recognize images. You can feed it a, uh, a picture of a school bus. And it's clearly a school bus, and the CNN will recognize it. Mm -hmm. But by uh, cleverly messing up just a few of the pixels, the image is completely unchanged to the human eye. However, this exact same classifier now sees the school bus as an ostrich. So it's the bus to ostrich effect. Mm. Well, this is very troubling um, in a lot of ways. Uh, it raises but by the way you can't just throw you can't just randomly you know mess up the picture you have to do it in a very clever way right but right. it raises some important issues um, one of them is it leads to the whole question of comprehension does a CNN really understand things if you can hoax it this way uh, it also raises questions of if people are going to and they are using these CNNs for uh, Things which have security implications um, or imagine, you know, medical imaging where it has uh, implications for health and safety. Or law enforcement. Exactly. If these things have this inherent weakness, maybe there's something wrong with CNNs. It, I, I, you know, this is all just the speculation that's going on. No one really knows, but it, it leads to some very interesting questions and – the, the research goes on at just giving uh, more interest in research um, in particular. Um, some of my colleagues are working on trying to go back to the very, very early days uh, where instead of just using raw math and raw processing, we're going to try to do some symbolic and some sort of a deeper level of understanding. Hmm. Can you elaborate on that? What, is that uh, what does that mean in this context, and how will we apply uh, symbolic uh, symbolics here? Yeah, Look, because we just hired uh, a per the person who is considered the leading guy in this area, and he only started here. Here is uh, Paul, and I'll spell his last name, S-M-O-L-E-N-S-K-Y. Paul Smolensky. Uh, we just hired him out of Johns Hopkins University, and he's been um, what many people, including me, consider the leading researcher in this area of symbolic reasoning and machine learning. Uh, 
I got his book and I'm, I'm a fairly bright guy. I have a PhD, but this was a complicated book. Um, he, he, <laughs> he's thinking at a different level and he's trying to, um, I had an interesting chat with him in the, uh, the hallway the other day. Uh, he, he sits right behind me and, uh, the analogy goes like this. When I was an undergraduate, um, uh, my very first degree was in cognitive psychology, um, which through various things, you know, that led to math and that led to computer. But anyway, uh, when I was in my cognitive psychology days, I worked with a, um, a, a brilliant researcher, R. Duncan Luce. And he, his goal was to create a complete mathematical framework and description of certain areas of psychology, the human mind. In other words, try to map <laughs> cognition how do people think um you know because still we we still don't know how people think well to to map that paul um is attempting in some ways to create a meta framework for symbolic reasoning and and logic mm -hmm. um, this is right now deep neural networks have been remarkably effective in doing what i call um the sort of sensory aspect of artificial intelligence. Imagine the five senses that we have. Um, vision, uh, you know, vision and pattern and image recognition, they're really good at. Speech recognition, they're really good at. Um, even the robotics, manipulation, they're really good at. But the one thing that they just were, were not even close right now is the reasoning aspects of it. And that's what the symbolic type of process is, is designed to do, or one area. You know, it's, it's, it's one attack on this. So I, I know that was a little bit vague and fishy, <clears throat> excuse me, <laughs> uh, but maybe you can get Paul uh, in a future one of your uh, podcasts to talk about. I'd love to, I'd love to hear what he has to say. Okay. Awesome. Yeah, that'd be great. Uh, so we've got uh, CNNs, RNNs, uh, and I, I still, um, I still want to probe around this the the idea of network architecture and uh, residual learn. I, what um there was a a blog post uh, by a guy named uh, Stephen Merity who's uh, at at Salesforce now. Um, he came in via one of their uh, recent acquisitions. And uh, if I remember correctly, he wrote this blog post and the title was something along the lines of network architecture is the new feature engineering, meaning uh, in traditional machine learning, uh, you know, a big part of the job was trying to figure out how to uh, how to massage your data and how to uh, create, you know, whether, you know, natural or uh, man-made, uh, features that express the underlying properties of your data in a way that your machine learning algorithms can easily train on those and produce accurate results. Mm -hmm. And in this new world, um, you know, defining it, the network architecture of your deep neural nets is kind of the moral equivalent, if you will. It's the, it's the new thing that we need to do to kind of massage our data and our, solutions to produce accurate results. And I'm trying to, I'm wondering if you can help us uh, wrap our heads around like what that process looks like and, you know, what are the things that, um, you know, researchers or engineers are thinking about as they're, you know, they, they start with a problem. They say, I've got this data set and I think a uh, deep neural net is the way to, uh, to solve this problem. Like, how do they then get to, oh, well, the optimal answer is something that I'm going to call a deep residual, you know, network that has 150 layers and, you know, these convolutional layers and every fifth layer is a residual layer and that whole, th <laughs> that whole process. Is that something you can speak to? Well, yeah, I, I'll talk about this because um, the sadly, the... The bottom line is there's no good answer to this. That <laughs> it, if, if it, sort of the the phrase that everybody's heard a million times is that machine learning and AI and deep learning and all this is still as much art as it is science, uh -huh. and that's 
that has been true and it still is true. Um, very, there, you know, some incredibly bright people who work in this field. I, I'm fortunate enough to work with some of the greatest minds. I mean, you know, they're, they're, they're world famous and, and leaders. But when we sit around, you know, drinking coffee and chatting about this, there's so much unknown. Um, it, even the, the, the brightest guys in the world are learning daily in, in new stuff. And for instance, the, uh, another uh, related thing here is um, that another hot area is reinforcement learning, um, uh-huh. which is, you know, how and that, you know, how does that fit in? And, you know, even among my colleagues, we're talking about, you know, you know knowledge is our, you know, I mean, we're, we're knowledge junkies, you know, we're just constantly trying to soak this information up. But things are happening so fast and there's so much unknown um, The 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 area you're talking about, network architecture, that's uh, one way. I mean, y- that would be a good surrogate term for exactly what's going on in all of research now. It's almost all related directly or indirectly to the architecture. Now, I'm a pretty sim- – I, I, you know, I believe in simplicity. And for me, network architecture or deep architecture is really simple on the one hand, where it's just how you – combine your processing nodes and not so much input and output in in different ways. Uh, And it boils down to, uh, think about the human brain. There's been some interesting work done by, uh, of all things, DARPA, the uh, defense agency, uh, in conjunction with IBM, where one of the projects they have, and, and Microsoft has a similar project that I don't think I can talk about now, its name, it's still under wraps, but I can give you a rough idea uh, of what we're doing by talking about the IBM and the Department of Defense thing, where the idea here is that instead of, it's almost too simple, instead of using the approach we're using right now, which is to get very clever with very specific types of architecture, very, you know, just think of a blueprint. Instead, take the approach that the human brain may have, and that is just make your architecture a bunch of a bunch of nodes totally connected. In other words, like the human brain. Hmm. And then uh, instead of using supervised learning where you have to have labeled data, you have to have known correct outputs with your you know inputs, uh, use unsupervised learning. And I'm sort of tossing out a uh, smorgasbord of terms here, but Unsupervised learning is another incredibly hot area of research right now mm-hmm. where we realize that methods that require labeled training data, which is just the way to say uh, data where you tag what the correct output is, that can only take you so far. It's just not going to scale to the um, you know the kinds of things that we want to do. Anyway, back to the DARPA IBM thing, they're, they're creating this thing where their goal is to create a uh, a processor in hardware, because, you know, IBM is known for that, that kind of work, that is, you know, scales to biological levels. And as far as I can recall from last time I read that, or an article on it, they believe that they have successfully created in hardware um, uh, a neural network, and they're not calling it that, that roughly simulates the complexity of the brain of a honeybee. And hmm. then, okay, the question here is not, okay, so how does it learn? And, you know, that, that wraps around back to the symbolic thing. So anyway, sorry, that was kind of a rambling answer here, but I agree that you're right, that it's right now, if you wanted to summarize all of the, or, or most of the areas, including these generative uh, adversarial networks, the uh, uh, long short term memory uh, networks, the residual networks. It's all about the architecture. Mm-hmm. Uh, so to to maybe further summarize, um, I guess the way the the way I kind of take away, what I would take away from what you are saying is, you know, maybe on the one hand, um, you know, to ask, you know, how do we create new network architectures mm-hmm. for a given problem. It, we're just too early to, yes. to right now we're in the stage where 
the fact that we come up with a new architecture for our problem that is that works and is useful, like that's a big deal. And and we're going to have to do a lot of that before we can say, oh, this is the process for creating new architectures for Absolutely. our given problems. Let, let me interrupt by saying, uh, sorry for interrupting you, but you just recalled to my mind um, a, a very well-known paper um, it's actually not even a paper. It's uh, um, basically a blog post, but it's extremely well known uh, in the, you know, in our field. And it's called the unreasonable effectiveness of recurrent neural networks, um, with the idea being that, you know, there's no obvious connection, you know, for the person who I, I tried to look up. I could not find too much history on recurrent neural networks. Um, there was some indication, but it's not exactly clear who thought of them first. But uh -huh. it's not at all obvious. You know, you have these re re recurrent architecture. They just work unexpectedly well. So, you know, <laughs> un unreasonably well. So the point is none of this stuff is obvious. And, and we're still in the very, very early stages of figuring all this out, exactly what you said. Mm -hmm. And then uh, I guess along those lines, if I am a listener and I'm building, I, wanna, I want to create a solution – you know, does it stand a reason that, you know, what, where would you start if you were building something? Like, would you even, would you even try to build your own deep neural net or would you use uh, some off the shelf implementation? Would you, you know, use a service? Would you, uh, if you thought that you like, how would you know if you needed to build your own thing? Um, that, that's an interesting question. And there's a, a, a there's I don't want to say controversy, uh, but um, clear differences of opinion here. Um, <clears throat> my personal opinion is that whenever I'm going to tackle a problem, for instance, my, um, one of the problems that I'm fascinated by and have worked on for many years is predicting uh, American national NFL uh, football scores. And uh, I like that as an interesting problem. Because uh, it's concrete, it's practical, and you can determine your, you know, how good you are right away. And I originally started using sort of standard canned um, approaches. Um, I started with sort of regression techniques, and then I started using regular sort of neural networks from a tool like Weka, like TensorFlow, and things like that. Uh -huh. And I got up to a certain level of accuracy or goodness, and I just couldn't get better. No matter what I did, I couldn't get better until I threw it all away and created my own neural architecture from scratch, mm. where it was custom designed for this problem in much the same way that convolutional networks are absolutely custom designed for image recognition with um, you know, they're, they're optimized because an image has pixel values and the RGB, or red, green, blue values. Well, anyway, to cut to the chase or to reiterate, I totally believe that at least now with the tools that we have, you get the best results by far by creating your own custom version. And I do. Now, the problem here is that I write code every day, and these things are not easy, right. uh, even for extremely advanced developers. And it's very time-consuming and very difficult. So there, there aren't. Yeah, you know, I'm not trying to sound boastful, but there aren't many people like me who can spin up a um, custom-designed neural network in, you know, uh, two two days or a week. Mm -hmm. So I think it's going to boil down to eventually boil down to problems. One of the things that we talk about a lot at Microsoft um, is the democratization of AI or machine learning. Uh, say, you know, sure. I'll call it machine learning. And the analogy here is maybe uh, uh, you and some of your listeners can remember the days, the very early days when spreadsheets, Lotus 1, 2, 3, uh, were just becoming popular. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people were saying, what, what, why why are companies, including Microsoft, uh, making these spreadsheets? Why would people, why would normal people ever want to use a spreadsheet? This is just something for accountants. So, but then uh, Lotus 1, 2, 3, and later Excel and, and the others uh, democratized 
numeric processing with spreadsheets. And then all of a sudden, all kinds of interesting good things happened uh, from that. In much the same way, um, the goal to democratize uh, machine learning is the idea that if you give some basic machine learning tools and knowledge to millions of people, they're going to find interesting ways to use it and solve problems that we haven't even thought of. Mm -hmm. That said, though, I still believe that just like you can only do so much with Excel um, and numeric processing, you'll only ever be able to do so much with a canned program or no matter how powerful the tool is and that there's always going to be the need for um, uh, machine learning artisans. I don't know if I said that word right, that go in and create custom models and custom prediction models for particular problems. <laughs> Your description made me, uh, prompted me to ask myself, what is the VBA for deep neural nets? <laughs> right? yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, um, uh, let's, let's skip that rat hole for a second. And, um, before we leave, I want to talk to you about uh, applications, including the stuff that you do uh, around NFL scores. Uh, but before we leave that, um, there are a couple of areas that I wanted to dig into around. Uh, and these are all things that I, I noted that you wrote blog posts around. Uh, one of them is around, uh, I made this comment about network architecture being the new feature engineering uh, but in fact, it sounds like there is some of the old feature engineering that's still important and that uh, needs to be done around data encoding and normalization when dealing with uh, neural nets and deep neural nets. And I was wondering if you could speak to that. Uh, and then I wanted to ask you about uh, dropout and cross entropy error as well. OK, so I didn't quite follow the first part. Uh, of what you're asking exactly? Oh, you wrote this blog post uh, about data encoding and normalization. Uh -huh, uh -huh. And um, I didn't dig into that post uh, in a lot of detail, but I was wondering if, um, if there are hmm. specific techniques in, the, in those areas related oh, to neural nets and deep neural nets uh, beyond the kind of things that you do in traditional machine learning. Uh, very, very interesting. Um, this is something that uh, I'll answer indirectly, as you, it seems like uh, I always do. Um, <laughs> the, the bottom line is that, okay, neural networks, no matter how you um, slice and dice it um, uh, currently, they, they only understand numbers. They're, they're, they're number crunchers. Now, very, very interesting, complex number crunchers. So all of your input data eventually has to be – not eventually, has to be right away turned into some kind of numeric form so it can be uh, understood by the neural network. And people who are new to the field, this is often one of the most discouraging parts of learning machine learning is that at, it seems that there's an endless number of um, data transformation techniques and just all this data massaging before you can ever get to the really interesting part. And it, it can get quite depressing for new people. But I always tell um, my audiences when I'm doing training and things like that, that fortunately, there, there's only a discrete number of these things. You have to learn. For instance, there are four real ways, I mean, four major ways to normalize your data so it's all scaled to roughly in the same range or so. Now, once you know those four, and once you understand when they're used and when they're not used, have a few examples, then you got it. But at first, you know, when you're first trying to learn it, it seems like hopeless. Oh, man, I've got to worry about data normalization. I've got to worry about data encoding. In the same way that there is um, uh, only a few ways uh, for data encoding. Mm -hmm. Now, so uh, the answer is that – oh, and then – and none of those things have changed with deep neural networks. Got it. However, I'm always cautious to say because that's sort of the accepted, generally accepted truth. But I love to, you know, take – whenever I hear something like that – in fact, I hadn't really thought about it until you, you asked this question. I always like to go back and look and go, you know what? Is this really true? Just because – 
everyone says it's true. It just sort of like creates like this viral thing. Here, here's an example where I argue all the time with my colleagues. It's something very basic. Suppose you're trying to use a neural network. This is going to be a little bit technical, but you're, suppose you're trying to use a neural network to predict something that can only take one of two values. For instance, you're trying to predict whether a person is male or female based on a voting behavior, based on age, based on income, based on all these other things. So in other words, it's a binary classification problem. Mm -hmm. Now, the standard and totally accepted by everybody, except me, technique is to create a neural network that has only a single output node. And that single output node is going to be a number between 0 and 1, where values less than 0.5 are going to indicate one of the two uh, outcomes, male, say, right. and values gr greater than 0.5 are going to indicate the other, female. So, and that is mathematically efficient, as opposed to the alternative of having a neural network that has two output nodes explicitly, where they sum to one. So you right. still get the same result. In other words, it, it'd be if uh, your, your uh, listeners know about a, a multi-class classifier, you just use the exact same architecture, but with two output nodes. In other words, when you're doing classification, you will never ever see a two output node neural network classifier because the idea being that if you're trying to predict one of two things, just make it a single node. Well, I tell everybody, I go, you know, okay, yeah, it makes sense, but I haven't, you know, explain that to me, you know, prove that to me that um, one node is exactly equivalent to two nodes. And so but anyway, my point, I'm, I'm getting fired up because I, like I'm, <laughs> I, I, I'm passionate about questioning common knowledge. So back to your thing. So it's common knowledge now that the data encoding and normalization techniques uh, that were commonly used and are being used for standard neural networks, we don't need anything new for deep neural networks. I'm not so sure. Well, before we leave the the specific example, are you are you excited about questioning the fact that uh, a two node network in this example is uh, inferior to a one node network, or have you demonstrated that uh, there are some cases that a two node network is superior to a single node network or for some um, external reasons by external reasons? I mean, like, you know, maybe they're the same in terms of accuracy, but implementation wise, one is better than the other. Um, uh, what's the source of your excitement around this question? Well, there's um, there's two, I'd say a couple or at least two reasons. OK, one. And primarily, I think it's hard to sometimes to be, you know, self-evaluating. I think it's probably psychological on my part where mm -hmm. in my world, knowledge is power. Knowing more than someone else is considered, you know, our mark of success. Yeah, take uh, I work with a lot of guys <laughs> who, who work in, in some form of sales. And for them, you know, I mean, everybody's competitive, but for them – a measure of success for them is how much money they make because that's the external kind of manifestation of their their goodness in some ways. Sure. Well, in you know uh, research and stuff, your measure is knowing something or coming uh, understanding something, publishing something first that the people didn't. So I think that there's a psychology there where if uh, uh, most people like me, you know, were competitive in in, in some sense of the definition, where if everybody is saying this, everything is, and I'm somehow able to prove everybody else was wrong, I'd get great satisfaction out of that. So uh, for, uh, that doesn't, I mean, it sounds kind of terrible, but I think that's part of it. Now, the other part is from an implementation point of view, um, I know that working on the code end of things, every implementation that I've seen has a completely, has sort of two different code bases for neural network classifiers, one for binary classification and one for all other cases. But if when you're classifying, uh, doing a binary classification and you have two output nodes, then 
you only have one code base. In other words, the neural network is the neural network where the number of output nodes is the number of uh, classes mm -hmm. that you're trying to predict. So from that engineering point of view, it's very um, appealing. There's an elegance to having yes. the same solution set, the same code base for yes. independent of the specifics of the problem or to not have the exception of the, mm -hmm. the single class or the two class prediction. Um, and then regarding training deep neural nets, um, what's the, what's the state of the art there? Um, and I think my sense is that, that, that training techniques or tell me if this is true or not, that training techniques are tied very closely to architecture at this point, meaning the research papers that talk about new architectures, um, are also talking about specific training techniques for the, for those architectures, or is that not the case? Uh, and then talk about uh, dropout, which is uh, I think that was Jeff Hinton's group in mm -hmm. 2014. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. If that's enough okay. to get going with. <laughs> I don't know. Um, well, first of all, I agree with you for, for the first part of your question, and that in general, well, there are a few exceptions, but in general, if you create a custom um, network architecture then you'll have to use a custom training uh, algorithm, optimization algorithm. Now, there's, I'll, I'll make a parenthetical remark that an area that I believe has great promise, and again, I'm in a very, very much of a minority view here, is that there are certain optimization algorithms and techniques that can be applied to any network architecture. And in general, they're called swarm intelligence optimization algorithms, hmm. uh, particle swarm optimization, and so forth. There's, there's some others. And basically, they just use absolute brute force. Uh, whereas most optim, uh, they're not based, uh, the swarm techniques are not based on calculus and gradients and things. So that's, you know, most optimization uh, algorithms are based on calculus, and you have to calculate derivatives. And the derivatives depend on the architecture. So that's why you've got to basically, in most cases, create a custom training uh, algorithm if you have a custom training ar uh, custom neural architecture. And then, uh, as I mentioned, uh, I'm intrigued by the idea of applying to swarm optimization to these things. I've made a few stabs at it, but like anything else, there's just uh, not enough time. Uh, going back, I remember in the previous uh, discussion we were talking about you know, my two node versus one node binary class. I just haven't had time to uh, look at it. It would take, you know, I, I'd have to dedicate a week or two to that. And mm -hmm. I, it, it, <laughs> like, like all of us, you know, I mean, I, I've got sure. more, more things that I have to do uh, than things than time to do. Um, so in short, uh, I agree with you that uh, um, uh, custom training algorithms are needed. Um, with the possible exception of swarm optimization, which uh, in my few stabs, I haven't been entirely successful, but I'm not ready to give up on them. Now, with regards to dro dropout is interesting. There's a whole bunch of, um, uh, not a whole bunch of techniques, but uh, quite a few techniques. And dropout is one. Now, I remember dropout training, uh, which is closely related to uh, jittering, uh, input jittering, uh, and so on. Uh, are all designed or mostly designed to prevent overfitting uh, in, during the train. That's sort of their motivation in most cases. And dropout training was everywhere, I'd say, two to three years ago. It, it was a very hot area of research, um, uh, a, a lot of excitement around it. And then it sort of faded out um, for reasons which aren't clear to me. I, I have this nagging suspicion a lot of times that – Trends in research, even you know, very high-end mathematical research, are subject to uh, to trends and fashions, just like a lot of things are. And sometimes things fall out of favor for no apparent reason. Uh, uh, an example of this that I like to point out is that there's a uh, a uh, neural network training algorithm uh, called resilient backpropagation. It's a a form of well, obviously a, a variation of backpropagation. I did some uh, experimentation on it where I generated artificial uh, data sets, very large artificial data sets, and the resilient backpropagation algorithm, what, I mean, clearly outperformed um, 
normal back propagation. Now, I have to say that with an asterisk. The problem with – it's almost impossible to compare – training algorithms because they all have so many hyperparameters, typically the learning rate, momentum rate, um, uh, regularization, you know, L1 regularization, L1. The, there's just too many parameters. You're, you're, you're not completely comparing apples to oranges, but you're comparing two different kinds of apples, perhaps. So it's very difficult to talk. Mm -hmm. So anyway, dropout training is something that just seems to be not be in fashion, but is there and um, uh, I'm I'm a, a believer in, in dropout training, but you know it's kind of funny. And now that you ask this question, I'm I'm thinking back to recent neural networks that I've done, and I haven't been using dropout to tell you the truth, um, because it is it's it, in my world. You know, I I, I, I spin up custom uh, neural networks myself, and um, uh, they're they're quite difficult to implement. It, it creates a lot of extra work, and so I take the hmm. often take the easy way out. And what is that easy way out? Is it? <laughs> I, I mean, besides from not using Dropout, yeah. <laughs> are there other things that you're doing with your data, or are there other algorithms that have the same effect of avoiding overfitting, or is it you know your standard you know uh, data segmenting, validation sets, that kind of thing? Yeah, you know, I I, I got to be honest with you, I don't really have a good answer to that question. You know, I'm not sure, uh, to, to be perfectly honest. Um, for for one, you know, here, I, I was talking to uh, the chief architect of um, Microsoft's uh, CNTK tool, which is our, uh, it's released to the public, you can find it on GitHub. It's our version of TensorFlow, um, mm -hmm. uh, deep uh, neural networks, including convolutional neural networks and recurrent neural networks and stuff. And I was talking to him one time because he's uh, not only a, a – he's a, he's a great he, – the main architect, very bright guy and uh, named Frank. And we were talking, and I uh, asked him a question. I, 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 I saw some really weird behavior that I didn't understand. I don't remember what the weird behavior was. And so I, I saw him. Uh, in the hallway, and I said, "Hey, Frank, you know," uh, and then I described the phenomenon. And he goes, "I said, can you think of anything uh, that would, you know, cause that to happen?" By the way, it later turned out it was just a weird, it was just weird, random randomness. But, uh, you know, Frank thought about it for a while. He goes, "You know, the only thing I can think of is that you've got a bug in your code." <laughs> and that was, I mean, he wasn't. And and I tell you, you know, when I saw that, uh, when I saw the behavior that I described, I, that's what that was my first surprise. I go, man, I I must have a serious bug in my code somewhere. Well, it turns out that it wasn't a bug at all. It was just sort of bizarre behavior. And but the conversation led us to talk about, it. and then you know our, our conversation sort of meandered. And and I said, yeah, I remember. I told him the story how how I spun up a uh, neural network. Uh, this is a few years ago, and I was using it for you know works it was i was actually using it was performing very well until one day i was looking at the code dusted off the code and realized i'd missed a com i completely missed updating one of the bias values um in other words I completely was ignoring one of the constants in the uh, equation and yet the, the neural network was performing well. So the moral of the story, and, and so I mentioned that to Frank. He goes, yeah, I, I've done this many times myself. So what's happening here is when you create a neural network, it's really, really hard to tell it, if it's good or not because you can get, you can get good results and have a seriously flawed uh, implementation. Mm. So in the same way by uh, – I'm coming back to this dropout thing where adding dropout or removing dropout, you, you'd think it'd be a relatively easy to tell is this helping me or hurting me it's not at all easy to determine hmm. in in total the, the there are a few things that have been really interesting uh for me about this conversation but one of the most uh is the like the the hard definitive stand you took on the need to craft your own networks mm -hmm. and uh, I think how that what that relates to here is I don't know I guess the the idea that uh, deep neural nets are 
you know, they're kind of magic black boxes, right? And uh, they're particularly magic. They're magic black boxes, even if you built them from scratch. That's quite right. And they're particularly, they're going to be even worse if you are using something out of the box that you don't fully understand. (laughs) Absolutely. And, um, And I think this also relates to... You know, there's always this question around, um, you know, using these out of the box tools and, you know, for many types of problems, you're trying to get from zero to 80 percent. And, you know, the researchers are trying to get from ninety five point two percent to ninety five point seven percent. And so that's kind of an argument for, well, you know, just use the tool, Mm -hmm. Um, you know, but if you yeah, even if you're just trying to get to 80 percent, if you really need to understand uh, what's happening, or you need to be able to understand what's happening in the case where, uh, it generally works great, but for whatever, some variant in your input data produces outlandishly wrong results. Like you have to know what's going on under the covers. Quite. I mean, I, I think you, I think you phrased that really, really well. I guess, uh, how are we doing on time? Are you still, do you have, I'm about, uh, I have a meeting that started, right now Uh oh okay so we'll have to wrap this up i'm afraid okay so we'll wrap this up maybe i can just ask you to quickly tell us about you you mentioned you do your own research you've done uh some projects like nfl scores like what's your what's the project that you're most excited about and maybe give us a quick overview of that and uh if it's something that's public where we can learn more um well, the the project I'm working on right now, interestingly enough, is that Microsoft recently launched what's called the AI School. Okay. Um, this is a big deal. Microsoft uh, is a large organization, and we create products and services. Microsoft has made a massive investment, both money-wise and um, sort of culture-wise, where our senior leadership believes that putting intelligence, real intelligence, into every product and service that we do is critically important. Um, uh, so some of our um, uh, senior leaders I've seen say something where they believe that this wave of adding artificial intelligence and machine learning intelligence into our products is every bit as important as when, you know the internet uh, came to pass. So towards that, uh, Microsoft created what's called the AI school, and I was um, uh, hired from my uh, previous to help run uh, the AI school uh, because I had a background in education, and I'd say that I'm um, uh, pretty, relative to most of my peers, I have a pretty broad uh, knowledge of many areas of machine learning and AI, although I'm not nearly as deep uh, Mm -hmm. as they are, of course. So that's what I'm working on right now. I'm trying to spin up, uh, trying to determine how to transfer knowledge of all these things that we just talked about in, and place that knowledge into the hands of the software developers that we have, the project managers that we have, the business decision makers that we have, the salespeople who sell our products and, and generate the revenue that you know keeps me employed. Because uh, everybody, I w- was surprised we, we sent out an announcement uh, to this like, um, Oh, we're creating the AI school. And we, we thought we'd get a, you know, maybe a couple hundred uh, messages of interest uh, exclusively from uh, engineers and developers. But we got thousands and thousands. Literally, we, I mean, we were overwhelmed by the response. And not only just from engineers. I think engineers see pretty clearly that machine learning and artificial intelligence skills are quickly becoming must-have skills for them. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, In other words, they're going to have to know how to put logistic regression in, or they're going to have to know the difference between this kind of classifier and that kind of classifier. Right. So that made sense, but we were surprised by the number of people, um, uh, designers, uh, UI people, uh, literally across the organization, people are excited. So that's what I'm working on now, and I'm very uh, passionate about this and very interested in it. And uh, trying to uh, deliver this knowledge while at the same time, 
in, in fact, I remember the uh, the researcher who hired me uh, to run this, and, and, and he's actually in charge, is one of the most famous names in speech recognition. He basically created uh, the technology behind Cortana, which is the same hmm. as the uh, uh, technology behind Siri. I mean, extremely famous guy. But And he told me uh, when I was uh, interviewing for this position from my, my old position just upstairs, by the way, he, he told me, you know, how are you going to manage or how are you going to balance doing, you know, your job of creating training classes and delivering classes and doing videos and stuff with – the need to stay uh, up to date because things are rolling out on a you know weekly monthly basis. Right. And right. I said, well, you know that's that's the challenge. So, you know, I'll, I'll conclude by saying you know, I'm really excited about working on the Microsoft AI school, but also really excited about all the all the things that are going on, generative, adaptive neural networks, and and um, uh, all these other things. And now you've got you certainly got me excited about this AI school, and probably a lot of listeners as well. Is this primarily an internal resource or mm -hmm. will it be a public resource uh, that Microsoft is promoting? Yeah, it's a good, good, good question. Something that we've talked about and we're really not quite sure. You know, our, our, our mandate, of course, initially at least, is to um, provide this internally. Mm -hmm. now, it's not a secret or anything, but we don't have any uh, externally facing kind of information very much. But on the other hand, a lot of people are saying, hey, you know, I mean, we want to the the content that we develop could be useful to everybody. Right. The the deal here is that there's a lot of content out there already. Um, what we're trying to do is find our sweet spot where how can we use our particular areas of expertise? We don't want to just rehash and redo. Say, for instance, um, most of your listeners uh, probably know about Andrew Ng out of uh, Stanford, his mm -hmm. excellent uh, online courses, which, which I think are uh, probably pretty much state of the art. We don't want to just try to replicate that right. for a couple of reasons. We'd be wasting our time and we probably wouldn't do as good a job. So mm -hmm. we're trying to find areas uh, where we have our internal expertise – and uh, so not only the, the knowledge, but the method of delivery. And once we figure that out, then I fully believe that we'll be able to share that with everyone. Great, great. With that, James, you've been very gracious with your time. Thank you so much. Uh, and look, for, look forward to uh, keeping in touch and to our, you know, when we meet in person at the, the Future of Data Summit. Well, thanks, Sam. It was a pleasure chatting with you and thanks for your time. All right, everyone, that's our show for today. Once again, thank you so much for listening and for your continued support. Please remember that we want to hear from you. You can comment on the show via the show notes page, via the at AI Twitter handle, or my own at Sam Charrington handle, via our new Facebook and YouTube pages, or just via good old-fashioned email to sam at twimmelai.com. Please do show some love to our new Facebook and YouTube pages, though. Your likes and subscribes there will really help support the show. And remember, if you're catching this podcast on Friday, you've still got time to register for our Strata Hadoop giveaway. The winner will be announced on next week's show. The notes for this show and all the links I've mentioned will be posted at twimmelai.com talk 13. Thanks again for listening and catch you next time.